Heather, thank you very much. It is indeed our last look at this letter. Uh, a little letter, but um, a vital letter. Um, if you're here for the first time, um, you're joining us in a little series looking at this part of the, the New Testament. And I know talking to some of us, we found it strong medicine. Um, hearing it all again, we hear the strength of it. It talks about these godless false teachers, uh, these condemnation that they face, and it is also medicine. It's, it's what we actually need for uh, living as Christians today. Um, what I want to do is just remind us of verses 3 and 4, which I think is so uh, significant for understanding the whole letter. The main instruction in verse 3, here's Jude, he's writing to Christians, and he says, I was very eager to write to you about the salvation we share. I felt I had to write and urge you to contend for the faith that was once for all entrusted to the saints. That's the main instruction of the letter. Fight for the gospel of the Lord Jesus, the faith, the body of truth. And the reason for it is verse 4. Certain men, he tells them, whose condemnation was written about long ago have secretly slipped in among you. And there are two problems with what they're doing. They're godless men. They change the grace of our God into a license for immorality. So they've understood the grace of God to mean that they can live as they like. As God is so gracious, he's so kind, it doesn't matter how we live. And that is linked to the other problem, the last bit of verse 4. They deny Jesus Christ our only sovereign and Lord. If you say you can live as you like, because that's what you think God's grace means, which of course it doesn't, then of course you are still being Lord. You're denying that Jesus is the only Lord. And Jude, in the middle of his letter, makes it very clear that these godless men are heading for certain condemnation because they are cruel and they're self-interested alone. And there's nothing new in that, says Jude, because God's been judging people like that for generations and generations. And he gives this string of examples through that middle part of the letter from the Old Testament, all sorts of groups of people, all sorts of individuals. And one or two conversations, as I say, people are, I think, shocked by what Jude is saying and perhaps slightly sobered by the judgment he describes on people. But Jude says in our last little portion, verses 17, actually we we shouldn't be surprised by the fact that God is going to do that. The Old Testament prepares us that he's got a God like this. But even the apostles, verse 17, they also told us that these godless men would be around. That's where we pick it up. Let me read verse 17 again. Dear friends, remember what the apostles of the Lord Jesus Christ foretold. They said to you, it's interesting that, isn't it? They said to you, in the last times there will be scoffers who will follow their own ungodly desires. That's exactly what the apostle Peter said in 2 Peter chapter 3. Scoffers will come. They'll pour scorn on what you believe. They'll mock you for how you behave. I don't know all the circumstances of it, but I heard recently there was this man walking outside St. Paul's Cathedral in the precincts of the cathedral, and he was asked to stop reading the Bible aloud. The police were happy, but the cathedral authorities weren't. In the entertainment industry, do you notice, I'm sure you do, the scorn that is poured on those who would preserve sexual relations for marriage between a man and a woman. In schools, I'm sure you are aware, the horror, the scorn on any suggestion that Jesus is the only way to God. And just occasionally, Christians can sound surprised. I can't believe it's got to that. Jude says, remember the Old Testament. Remember what the apostles said. Remember what's been foretold. Don't be surprised. Shocked, yes, sobered, yes, but not surprised. And so, he says, we must contend. It's real and it's contemporary And in a sense, we come in this last part to what we've sort of been waiting for for some verses, which is, what do you mean, Jude? What do you mean, contend? How do I do that? How do I fight for the truth? What should we do? If you did follow the World Cup, which you may have done, you noticed as some matches drew to an end, 
Um, both teams started getting a bit edgy, and they would go sort of on the offensive to avoid the dreaded penalties. And the best form of defense became attack. Just throw caution to the wind. Everyone gets up there, the keepers in the box and so on. For the gospel of the Christian faith, there's a sense in which the best form of defense is attack. The contending will always mean that we proclaim Christ faithfully to all people. That's the best way to contend in one sense. We keep proclaiming the gospel clearly and faithfully as we can. But Jude, at the end of his letter, he comes to some specifics. And they're very personal and they're very involved and they're very important. Let's just have a look down as he addresses the dear friends he's writing to once again. The first way to contend, he says, is to keep yourselves in God's love. The main thing for verses 20 and 21 is to keep themselves in God's love. I know there's lots of things going on in 20 and 21, but in actual fact, keep yourselves in God's love is the only command. If you're an English sort of person, you like grammar, it's the only imperative. And all the other verbs in those verses are actually participles, ing words, as I'd explain to the children. They are building yourselves up, praying in the Spirit, waiting for the mercy of Jesus. The main command is you keep yourselves in God's love. Now, just as a side thing, I think that's really telling. As he says, here he's saying how to contend. The first thing he says, having explained so graphically about the false teachers, that they're condemned, that they're cruel, and all those sorts of things, what you might expect him to say is the way to contend is to deal with the false teachers. Banish them, rebuke them, tell them to be quiet. But actually, the first way he says to contend is keep yourselves in God's love. You attend to yourselves, first of all. You can't do anything for anyone else until you're in the right state. Keep yourselves in God's love. And that means to keep living out the relationship of love which God has brought you into. Keep obeying the loving God as he tells you how to live. Jesus in John 15, he tells the disciples, you remember, if you love me, you will you'll remember it, not sing more choruses, not feel a flutter in your heart, but obey me, obey my teaching. If you love me, you'll obey me. The main sign of love for Jesus is obedience to Jesus. Keep yourselves in God's love, keep on living the Christian life with humble obedience to the one who loves you and brought you into relationship with him. Not because that's going to save you, of course. You may remember verse 1 right at the beginning, they're described as people who are being kept by God for Jesus Christ. But knowing that he's keeping you, you keep yourselves in him by obeying him. Remain in me and I'll remain in you, says Jesus. And then the participles, verses 20 and 21, if you like, are ways of keeping yourselves in God's love. So yes, verse 20, you must be building yourselves up in the most holy faith. On Adamhurst Road at the moment, there's a number of building sites, and uh, there's a a company called Direct Demolition that has been hard at work destroying what were otherwise very lovely buildings um, to build new blocks of flats, and they'll be built, I guess, at high speed. I'm always amused by the name Direct Demolition, sort of wonder what indirect demolition might look like. But that's where Jude's got to. He's got to the building picture. He says... You Christians, you're to build yourselves up in our most holy faith. Faith that is not our response of trust, right at the beginning of the letter, but the body of truth that is the gospel. Given by a holy God, it's a holy faith. So I can't contend for the faith unless I know the faith. If you know the faith well, the gospel well, you won't be drawn in by distortions of the faith. I think it's still true that if you work in the Royal Mint, producing banknotes, those there are not trained to look for forgeries by looking at lots of other forgeries. They're trained to spot the fakes by endlessly looking at real banknotes. As I look at the true faith in God's Word, the Bible, then I'm better equipped to spot untruth, distortions, and so on. We're to be in the Bible so we know better and better our holy faith. There are some Christians who think that the Bible is a bit like a diving board at the swimming pool. It's a good start to get you going. It's a place to leap from 
into the real experience of exploring all the amazing ideas out there about God. It's not right, though, is it? The real picture, if you want to carry on with this picture, the Bible is the swimming pool. You're built up on your faith of the gospel as you plunge into God's Word more, deeper and for longer, to understand the faith more. And you see in verse 20, it's a corporate activity. Dear friends, beloved people, build yourselves up in your most holy faith. Not just your personal devotional times, it's talking about knowing the faith with others. And perhaps one of the first signs of a Christian in danger is that they're becoming a loner, separate from other believers, and not knowing the faith with others. A brick can't be made into a new building unless it's on a building site, if you like. It's one of the reasons we're trying to encourage people to pick up a Christian book over the summer if you're not used to reading, and if you are, are you still growing in knowing the faith, knowing God's Word, the Bible, that shows us what the faith is. So, building yourselves up. Verse 20 as well, praying in the Spirit. We've heard it this morning, haven't we? Every Christian believer who turns and trusts Jesus receives the gift of God's Holy Spirit. There is no real Christian without God's Holy Spirit. And we pray in line with the will of the Spirit. That is, we pray that what the Holy Spirit caused to be written in the Bible would be worked out in our own lives. I don't think praying in the Spirit here is talking about some special type of praying that these believers here aren't quite doing, and if they'd only pray properly, then things would be easier. No, he says, pray that God's truth would become part of us, not just knowing it, but loving it. There's a Methodist preacher from some years ago, Samuel Chadwick. He said, the one concern of the devil is to keep the saints from prayer. The devil laughs at prayerless studies and prayerless work and prayerless toil, but he trembles when we pray. You might bear that in mind with the needs of your life, the needs of church life, the idea of the devil trembling when we pray. Praying in the Spirit. And verse 21, we are waiting for the mercy of Christ. There's a day coming when Jesus will return, and Jude's explained clearly enough that for godless people, it'll be a terrible day, judgment, condemnation, punishment. But for those who belong to him, a day of mercy to bring us to eternal life. Eternal life which has started now, but the fullness of which will come one day, and we're waiting for that day. Are you waiting for the mercy of Jesus? I wonder if you think you are, whether you know you are. You could just ask yourself, what are you most looking forward to? The weekend, the evening in, the treat you've booked, the holiday, or the mercy of Jesus as it comes? I'm with myself, I get preoccupied with good things, good gifts from God, but which just are short-term and imperfect compared to the mercy that's to come as Jesus returns. So keep yourselves in the love of God, building yourselves up, praying in the Spirit, waiting for the mercy of Christ. And once you're a stable Christian in that way, if you like, verses 22 and 23, you can turn your attention to other people. And he says, secondly, show mercy to others. Show mercy to those who've been affected by the godless men and the false teaching that is around. I don't know if you're skeptical of three points in a sermon. Oh, it's another three points. Always three points in a sermon. I think Jude has a bit of justification for three points. He seems to love three points. And I think in 22 and 23, there are probably three groups of people which uh, he is talking about. He's saying, you must show mercy to those who doubt, first of all. There will be some who hear of this distorted gospel. God is so gracious, it really doesn't matter how you live. They'll be drawn in by that. They'll be tempted by that. Why can't we live as we like? And they're dithering. They're unsure. They're perhaps muddled. And it's a good reminder, isn't it, that for those people, we are to be merciful. We want to contend for the truth. We want to be sure of what is right, and I guess we're all keen for that perhaps in some way, but we're to be merciful as we do that. Maybe you know Christians who have endless questions, they just don't get so many things, 
evolution, predestination, and God's view of marriage, and the end times. Jude says, you be patient with them as they ask their questions. You listen and understand. Be merciful to them. There are people who ask questions who just want to be a pain in the neck. But there are people who are genuinely asking, and they want to know the answer. And they're wavering and they're doubting. They need mercy and peace and patience. Be merciful too, though, says Jude, to those who are in danger. And this is verse 23. Be merciful to those who doubt. Snatch others from the fire and save them. Jude seems to have in mind a part of the Old Testament in Zechariah. So he's still brimming with the Old Testament, as we aren't so often. And in Zechariah chapter 3, God describes what he's done for God's people and in particular for his high priest at that time, Joshua. And God says, Is not this man a burning stick snatched from the fire? Jude is saying there are those who are very close to the flames of the distorted gospel. They're being taken in. They're being encouraged to live any way they like. And Jude says, for them, this is an emergency situation. They need snatching to safety. It's a friend of mine who's um, the area dean, which is a, a sort of Church of England role within a diocese in Kensington, near this place. And uh, he was very involved in helping those rescued in ordering food for them and blankets. That's the obvious thing to do, isn't it, when you pass danger, when you pass a fire. When people are in danger of fire, you don't just say, that's a very dangerous fire, I really pray you won't get hurt. Of course not. If you see someone in danger, whether it's fire or traffic, you grab them. Jude says there are some in very real danger. They need snatching from the fire to save them. And there are some, he says, who are facing disaster because if they've gone one step re removed away from the gospel again, just that last little bit of verse 23, to others show mercy mixed with fear, hating even the clothing stained by corrupted flesh. It seems Jude again is thinking of Zechariah 3, if you want to look that up afterwards, where Joshua the high priest has filthy clothes that he's been wearing removed. And God then says, see, I've taken away your sin. Jude is saying there are those who are corrupted and contaminated by the poison of the false gospel. And they nonetheless need mercy, just as there's mercy for any who repent and believe. So it's a fine line to walk, isn't it? That last group, great love and mercy for them. And yet with fear, I think that's fear of our own falling into that same sin. Fear to do the same things and at the same time hating their sin. Mercy with fear and mercy hating their sin. That's a tricky path to walk. Our culture, I think, does very different things, doesn't it? Our culture doesn't often treat with mercy, uh, that sort of holding off of bringing what someone deserves. Our culture generally operates on a, a rights basis, approving our point, not letting up. For Jude, mercy is the dominant attitude we're to have, to pass on what we've received, to pass on what we're waiting for, the mercy of Christ. And our culture, similarly, I think, generally keeps ourselves to ourselves. I don't know if you'd agree with that. We don't want to interfere, don't want to pry. That's their life. We're not really responsible. And Jude says here that there is a sense in which you really are responsible. Christians are to be in the business of helping doubters and snatching them from the danger that they're in. Many of you will know and heard of um, C.T. Studd, uh, an Englishman, the late 1800s, early 1900s. Uh, he gave up a life of fame and fortune and a wealthy background to be a missionary, served God in different places, China and India and Africa. He died in Africa. He described how often as Christians we're keener to remain in the church than to be with those who need saving. Rather than extend ourselves to snatch someone from the fire, we'd rather just be with our own. He said, some want to live within the sound of a church or chapel bell. I want to run a rescue shop within a yard of hell. 
might verse 23 mean, at the very least, a slightly more frank conversation than you've had yet, a particular meeting with them, as you humbly hate ungodly living and show mercy? Maybe there's somebody, even now that you can think of, somebody that you know, they're living immorally because they've misunderstood God's grace. Perhaps someone who's denying Jesus is Lord of the whole of their life. Is there someone you know who was here six months ago, but not anymore? Someone who's slipping. Someone you know that you've sort of shrugged off and you've resigned them to be miles away. Or is there someone who's drawing you into a particular pattern of living? As one preacher put it, do we love them enough to show them mercy, to speak to them? That is to snatch them. And I suppose if Jude ended there, it would be fine in one sense, a letter full of warnings, a letter packed with instructions for us. But he ends, you see, not with what we must do, though we must do it, but with what God will do. The most famous verses of the letter, perhaps 24 and 25, he says, praise God our Savior. Praise the Lord who will save his people. These are the famous calendar verses, and I guess we see now why they are for Jude's hearers. This is the God who does, well, at least a couple of things. He's the God who keeps you from falling. That's a huge work. He's able to keep you. Do you know, don't you, that the way God keeps his people is in two ways. He keeps them by his promises and by his commands. Just like the safety of a child crossing a road, a parent gives a promise and a command. I'll hold your hand, don't rush out before I say. And the child is kept as they trust the promise and as they obey the command. And Jude gives us promises in his letter with those who kept, God is able to keep you. And Jude gives us commands, keep yourselves in God's love. And at different times, Christians will need different ones of those. The casual Christian, you keep yourselves in God's love. The concerned Christian, agitated, sensitive, God is able to keep you. But also, he's going to keep you, and then he will present you, present you faultless on that day. Picture the scene, there's Jesus, and he takes his people and presents them to the Lord God. Father, I present to you John and Sue and Alan and Judy and Henry. They are now faultless. And no wonder they're presented as well with great joy. Won't it be amazing when you no longer have to wrestle with sin? When you no longer fight to stay godly? You're no longer tiring of having to exercise self-control all the time because we're perfect. We're being presented faultless. And all because of the only God, our Savior, who does it, verse 25, through Jesus Christ, who is our Lord. He will get all the glory, the visible shining holiness of God, the majesty, his awesome regal splendor, power, his unstoppable strength to do what he says he will do, and his authority, his unquestionable rule over everything. And he'll get that always and forever, before all ages, now and forevermore. Amen. One writer says, the fact that God himself has acted on our behalf to rescue us from a judgment we so thoroughly deserve, it means that the heavens will echo forever with our shout of praise to God our Savior. So there's contending to do, but praise be to God our Savior. We keep ourselves in his love. We show mercy to others, all with the backdrop that God is the great Savior and he will be glorified and he's powerful to bring his people to himself. In that security, we contend. In that assurance, we contend. May God give us strength for it. Amen.